Bueno, pues eh, muchas gracias a todas y a todos por estar aquí hoy en Decidir Fest en esta primera sesión de la tarde. Eh, esta creo que es la... Bueno, aparte de, la, de las charlas breves de mañana, que van a ser muchas, eh, están en múltiples idiomas, esta es la única sesión del día que se va a hacer en dos idiomas, eh, en castellano y en, y en inglés. Y bueno, con la idea de que cada, cada ponente pueda utilizar el idioma que prefiera y yo por defecto, para tener un idioma común, voy a utilizar el inglés. Pero podríamos hablar de preguntas, cualquier persona es libre de utilizar el catalán, castellano o inglés, el idioma que considere para interactuar con los ponentes. Vale, pues, bueno, primero me presento, para los que no me conozcáis, soy Pablo Aragón, soy investigador científico en la Fundación Wikimedia, he profesor asociado en la Universidad Pompeu Fabra y bueno, miembro del equipo de CIDIM desde, desde su origen. Y hoy estamos aquí en una sesión para hablar de desafíos... Ah, I, I said I was going to speak English, so sorry, yeah. So, today we are having this session about ethical challenges to the democratization of artificial intelligence. So, in this morning we have been talking a lot, like Xavi has been talking about, and, uh, and Robert, about artificial intelligence, like how this new technological paradigm is opening uh, new opportunities, how it's, uh, it's coming with great power to transform our society. Uh, and there was this discussion about the intersection of AI and collective intelligence and examples in, uh, in particular in platform for citizen participation like the CDM, but also your priorities. And that to uh, say that like for this great power of artificial intelligence to be exercised in a democratic uh, way, it is essential to, to raise and to face some critical some critical and ethical challenges that we, we need to discuss. And this is the purpose today. So, uh, for having, having some ideas about some of these challenges. Uh, I'm very honored and very thankful to our speakers today. First, we will going to have a talk on towards democratization of artificial intelligence, awareness, rights, and action by Sara Suarez Gonzalo. Is, most of you already know Sara. She was in the sitting fest two years ago, but for those who don't know Sara yet, she's a Juan de la Cierva postdoctoral researcher at the, Interna at the Internet Interdisciplinary Institute at the University, Open University of Catalonia, and lectures in communication. Uh, her research focuses on the social and political implications of data-driven technologies with a special interest in their effects on democracy, social justice, and fundamental rights. Uh, she co-directs the academic journal Quaderns of CACA, uh, CAC and is a member of the Advisory Council of Artificial, Intelli uh, Artificial Intelligence, Ethics and Digital Rights of the Barcelona City Council. So thank you very much, Sara. First, we will start with, with your talk. Thank you much, thanks, uh, Pablo, for your presentation, for your introduction, and as well as for the invitation to participate in the plan panel. I will talk in Spanish. I love this uh, festival. Uh, I always uh, love to come, even though it is with much respect. Uh, there are ma many difficult questions are raised, but they are also necessary. I will give you, I will share some thoughts with you, some of the worries I am thinking about. Uh, I've been working on some for some time with the idea that, uh, well, the idea of uh, sharing them so we can further debate. The easy question that uh, Pablo asked us uh, was uh, which uh, ethical challenges, uh, social, political challenges we do have to face and how, so that the transformative power of uh, AI is uh, transformed democratically. The quick answer is to, to these uh, which challenges and how. That's where we have to focus uh, more. We have to be involved uh, to think what what's happening and what do we want to happen and how it does uh, affect us uh, who is uh, harmed by this. How can we face these uh, problems with the advancement, the progress of AI? Where can we get individually? What do we need from public institutions? What do we have to demand the private powers also? I think it is important to give a, a joint answer to this because this progress, this increase of AI involves us all. On one hand, it uh, involves us 
regardless from our features or circumstances. There is a clear social impact and it is because that the strength of the AI systems are that they are fed from the commons and they are fed through individual surveillance and control which is a particular way of uh, getting in touch with the commons with its uh, limits the impact uh, the use of ai is massive and indiscriminated but on the other hand it implies us in very unequal ways uh, our social and demographic uh, characteristics, uh, age, uh, level of studies, uh, our place of birth, of uh, our residence, our, the color of our skin, and this is relevant. This reveals something simple and worrying. Technological development doesn't make us go towards a more fair society. So, these uh, affects us all, this affects the social configuration as well as uh, to people with uh, circumstances or particular features that what we are going to talk about, uh, Ashwin, will, Ashwin Singh will talk about this. This is uh, worrying when we think that uh, AI systems are used in the private sector which is relevant in the system where we do live, where private players have too much power. But more and more they are used in the public sphere regarding very sensitive matters. Something that worries many of us is that very often these systems are used in decision-making processes. Not to, not to say that they are used to make decisions, they shouldn't, even though they are used. Some more banal decisions in our video platforms to recommend that we watch this or that series, which route should we take with the car? Well, there are other uses that can difficult uh, cannot uh, be considered as uh, banal so to accompany the people to get uh, public uh, help or a system for the medical diagnosis of uh, someone's illness the ai systems or algorithm we talk about them that way they are basically tools uh, tools that uh, someone creates for something, for one purpose. And it is not that difficult to understand as uh, we had to think from the huge technology corporations that benefit from all this. There is something much relevant, is that uh, these uh, systems, uh, as well as the final consequences, are determined by human decisions from the beginning to the end. Decisions uh, such as someone defines one situation as a problem that he she considers that can be solved through the use of uh, a system of AI. Sometimes the one who makes the decisions knows uh, its limitations, its possibilities, the possibilities of AI. Once uh, this uh, problem, this solvable problem has been defined or solved, which data, which solution to be, uh, to be solved so the system can work and how do we have to shape this uh, problem. So we give instructions to the systems to solve the problem in a certain way and not in another. We even think that uh, to which extent we leave these systems to work in an autonomous way is also a human decision. Sometimes we say the systems work in an autonomous way. And sometimes we think, what will happen with the systems? Well, letting this happen is also a decision. These decisions are very deep and very important. And going back to Pablo's questions, I 
dare to say that in order to have a new scenario that will transform AI and in a much more democratic manner, maybe the first question that comes to my mind, which is not a simple question, it is to know the what, why, and for what. Who is going to take the decision? Who is allowed to take? Who is not allowed? What's the purpose of this decision taken? What are the goals that are included, the objectives that we include? Who is uh, taking advantage? Who will have some problems when this decision will be taken? What are the effects of this uh, power system created around this uh, technological development? It's not an easy task to go deeper, but it's not an easy task with everything that has to do with AI, right? Such as the development on the use of this system that we're always uh, together um, with this the kind of opacity, it's a very dark matter. These are systems that belong to the business model, to the big corps. And in the end, this is something that has to change. And it's important to say we must execute our pressure as much as possible. And suddenly came to my mind a doubt that I tried to solve that's always surrounding the debate of AI and the possible solutions to different problems, whether citizens are aware or not about what is happening with AI. Is people aware that these algorithms are used in different fields with different aims and goals? and objectives. Do citizens have an idea about how the system works, the impact on their lives and other people's lives, the social status? Is people worried about what is happening with AI? And do people know what they have to do with this regard, if they are worried about the impact of these kind of AI systems in their personal lives? Is this individual able to re be reactive? Can we react? These are essential questions, key questions, very interesting when observed from the power perspective, inequality, power concentration, and power abuses that in many, many cases are telling us what we know, what we do not know, what can we do, what we cannot do in relationship with our ideas, worries, and anxieties in relationship with AI uses. In broader terms, among citizens, uh, there is a lack of comfort people don't feel comfortable when using algorithms. And this entails something very interesting. More people than ever is aware that these technologies are used and these technologies will have an impact on their lives. I don't know if people are aware, maybe. Uh, sure, they are not experts on algorithms and AI, but I don't know if they are aware of it. It's nonsense to be an expert and to aspire to be an expert on AI. But do they citizens are aware that AI will have an impact on their lives? That's very interesting to me because many, many times the public speeches are surrounding and are around, around, going around about the need to make citizens to be aware. But many, many times people are aware about the risks despite in a very confusing manner, in a very dis diffuse, not a crystal clear manner, right? However, despite people being aware, they don't have the uh, in awareness, they are not aware enough to solve the worries that are coming to people's minds. So it, that's very problematic. We need to get some means. It's uh, vital to have time to get mechanisms and channels to be proactive and to get involved and to participate despite being very aware of a problem. If you are not allowed to be proactive, what can you do? Right? And as for these algorithm issues, we are having several studies in our research team. I'm working in communication networks and the social change at the UOC. There are loads of people together with me today here in this session. And uh, we are aiming at uh, publishing some results in the next future because, you know, in the academia world, everything is so slow. We have some data by the end of 2021 and a court of uh, citizens in from Spain and the use that the Spanish people did uh, with smartphones for a whole month. We assess what they did with the smartphones. And in order to underline the most impactful result of all the data that we got from this study is that this survey shows very contradictory results amongst the level of uh, algorithm awareness that we assess uh, through questions about the perfection and knowledge of algorithms of all the participants and the 
app use, application use, and software and programs used for their systems. Well, there are some contradictions between algorithm awareness and the use diversity of the, all these systems based on algorithms. It would be obvious to think that if we are aware that if we use these kind of uh, systems and the risks that they entail, we will adapt the use to the programs and the softwares and to adapt this uh, ability to be aware. And the more you use it, the more aware you are when dealing with the algorithms, right? But many previous surveys say that the level of use is a constant that we can see when using the algorithms. However, we found some contradictions that made me think and made me start a very small investigation project to work with an hypothesis, which is the paradox of the uh, algorithm awareness. That's the title that I gave it, algorithmic awareness, because uh, these uh, two concepts were very well studied uh, in the critical science, such as the paradox of privacy, that I'm sure that many of you know, the paradox of privacy. So, and this uh, paradox described the next situation. The digital practices and the relationship of people doesn't show um, robustness about the algorithmic awareness and the worries that they have. So it's kind of a tricky. This is what I'm doing right now. And for quite a few months, I'm working with uh, several focus groups to better understand uh, people's uh, position and to better understand this relationship. It's something that's very relevant that has to do with my uh, initial ideas. I try that participants to be very diverse, so to have a very different array of people uh, from the academia world. It's very difficult where only have in the service those that are involved and enrolled in the studies. And I paid a lot of attention to factors that have been proven to be very important for digital inequality. And I got focused on a very specific factor that it's not more visible than others, but it is something that's very relevant. It has to be with the elderly people and also the anxieties, uh, such as Andrea, uh, that's with me, and uh, Mireya, my colleagues that belong to this uh, survey group. I'm lucky enough to work with her, with them, and they are very worried about the topic. You know, many, many occasions, these digital surveys and AI surveys, they try, they neglect 60 old year, 60 year old people, so the elderly ones, and many. Uh, part of our population from 60 to 100 there are very very different uh, ages and ch life changes a lot and sometimes they are out they are the outcasted and uh, the elderly people they suffer a lot this uh, digital uh, gap more than many other uh, groups of our society so that's vital when we assess always from a cross-sectional perspective, always together with uh, other factors uh, such as gender, the level of education, economic level, if you live in rural area or in city. Therefore, in uh, this survey that I'm trying to implement, that was the idea to assess sustainability. It's an ongoing process, and that's the idea. The idea, in the end, is just to share this approach, and also the anxieties, the anxieties that we can see. And in broader terms, I can say that uh, this hypothesis, it's already confirmed. People are more than ever aware, but do we know how to be reactive, how to react, what to do? To me, in the end, this is a huge inequality of power that we are all experiencing and living, and we should face all together this lack of power and this inequality. Thank you so much. Fine. Many ideas. I wrote down loads of ideas. Academy goes very slow, <laughs> and I, I agree. Like a academy, which should be transformative, should be like a, a space of innovation. It is a, a space of innovation, but it's also many times like a space of resistance to new ideas. Is is is, is uh, opacus to to new trends and new new uh, views of how uh, the society should be interacted with different kind of, of artifacts that, that appear. So for that reason, given like uh, how hard it is to transform the, the academia and the scientific community, I'm particularly uh, happy 
that Ashwin is our next speaker, and uh, they will talk on lessons, opportunities, and challenges for participation in AI. Uh, for those who doesn't know Ashwin, and it will be many of you because he's a new kid uh, on the block. He just arrived to Barcelona. Uh, uh, Ashwin is a cure uh, Bahuian activist and researcher working in algorithm fairness and AI ethics. Uh, they are currently a graduate student at the Universidad Pompeu Fabra and previously served as the diversity, equity, and inclusion admin for Curian AI, a non profit organization that strives to make AI and AI spaces inclusive for Cure people. So, thank you very much for accepting our invitation, and the floor is yours. Hello. Yeah. Hi, everyone. <laughs> Sorry, Pablo, I have to leave. <laughs> send you back from the stage for it. Uh, so thanks for the introduction. Uh, today I'm here to talk about queer in AI, specifically why we exist, what we work on, and why it matters in the bigger picture of AI, or as Desidim more accurately calls it, collective intelligence. So about this talk, uh, I'll first give an overview of my talk. I will first cover a fundamental limitation in the way AI systems try to capture queer identities and how it extends to most methods in algorithmic fairness. Then, I will attempt to situate participatory methods in this context, specifically how we at Queer and AI do it. Lastly, the work covered in this talk is the result of activism by the Queer AI community over the last five years. Revolutions can be painstakingly slow. Sorry, there's a <laughs> mismatch with the, but hopefully I'll get used to it during the presentation. Uh, so AI and queerness. AI systems try to encode complex identities into narrow categories that are incompatible with queerness. A common example is the use of AI for automated gender recognition in applications ranging from surveillance and policing to censorship and moderation. And when these systems make errors, they affect trans and non-binary people disproportionately, leading to outcomes as bad as wrongful incarcerations. And if you take a closer look at these systems, especially those that use computer vision to falsely infer gender and sexuality, they closely mimic physiognomy, a pseudoscience that was, that, that was discredited in the late 19th century, but is now present in most surveillance applications. And in this way, a lot of these AI systems are nothing but a really bad combination of pseudoscientific assumptions with life-threatening consequences for queer people. So common approaches like computational methods from algorithmic fairness try to mitigate bias or trace the root of harm in AI systems. Now, they're not all bad and have great potential in domains like online harassment, healthcare, hiring and employment. But the limitation of encoding queer identities as discrete and static still holds. And most importantly, they fail to address more fundamental concerns surrounding the existence of these technologies. And what I mean by that is you cannot really mitigate bias in a technology that is designed to discriminate. Now, can participatory methods address this? Now, in theory, participatory methods hold great potential for empowering marginalized groups to not only question the existence of these systems, but also engage in designing gear that actually benefits them. But Participatory design is very difficult to operationalize in a setting where most AI is powered by exploitative labor of the same communities that it harms. So I urge that we take another step back and ask, should marginalized communities really engage in co-design with the creators of harmful AI systems who prioritize profit over their safety? Contrary to participation being controlled by corporations that design and own AI, I argue in the favor of shifting power towards marginalized groups and centering their experiences. And this is what motivates our mission to raise the awareness of queer issues in AI and machine learning and foster a community of queer researchers and celebrate the work of queer scientists. So let me start with some background about queer in AI. We began in 2017 when a group of queer researchers discussed their frustrations with the lack of representation at New Europe Sober Coffee. And inspired by affinity groups such as Black in AI, this group decided to organize a workshop for queer issues in AI and ML. And for the first two years, we lacked diversity and operated within a hierarchical structure. However, now we've organized 13 workshops and 35 socials and various AI conferences. We're global, no longer hierarchical, almost entirely volunteer run, mostly asynchronously over Slack. 
but it is important to discuss the principles that got us here and shaped our journey. We have over 1,000 members from more than 47 countries. But our strength lies, lies in acknowledging the differences in our experiences as a result of the difference in our identities. So we attempt to empower our most marginalized members to shape our initiatives, and this not only shifts power to them, but also amplifies their experience in the process. And as I discussed, we primarily operate on Slack, where most of our planning and coordination occurs. To be transparent and accountable, most of our channels are public, and any member can get involved simply by joining a Slack channel and contributing. And this decentralization not only helps in, in distributing power, but also preventing harassment, which is otherwise targeted towards leaders. We also operate at the highest level of community engagement, where community members participate beyond just sharing lived experiences or guiding research planning. They're involved in all stages of creating and launching, as well as administering an initiative. And this process inherently allows community members to share knowledge and mobilize for action. In this talk, I'll be focusing on these initiatives by the queer and AI community. So for the last five years, we've had four main initiatives towards supporting queer graduate school applicants, making academic conferences more accessible, inclusive, and welcoming for queer people, and establishing inclusive name change policies for trans people. Another focus in the last two years has been on our initiatives towards research, to, towards research and policy work for queer people in AI, specifically how AI auditing processes can be redesigned for evaluating queer harms, and how participatory methods can help build communities of resistance and change in AI. And these really serve as an indicator for how far we've reached and the power we have amassed with grassroots activism, because we not only published our research in the most selective venues on the ethics of AI, but also did policy briefs with the National AI Advisory Committee at the White House in the United States. So now that I've covered sufficient background about queer in AI, let me start by introducing our first initiative on financial aid for queer graduate school applicants. Now, for any applicant applying to graduate school in the US, this is what the breakdown of costs look like. There's application fees, fees for JRE, TOEFL, and test postal fees. And when you add these all up, and if an applicant applies to, let's say, five schools, this cost can easily amount to 1,200 USD. And if you put, if you put this number in more context, here, is, here are some statistics from three countries from the global south about minimum wages. Thus, our program aims to remove these financial barriers faced by queer scholars and promote their access to higher education by covering their application costs. By design, our program is not competitive. As long as we have the funds and the applicants pass minimal verification, we cover their costs. However, in doing so, there's, an, there's a tension between our role in subsidizing fees for rich institutions and providing aid. Our position is that of providing timely aid to queer applicants, even if it reinforces existing barriers. In the last three years, we funded 160 queer applicants to graduate school, 60% of who belong to marginalized groups. Next, I'll be talking about our workshops and socials at AI Conference, and consequently our work on making them and their proceedings more inclusive. Our demographic survey showed that queer people don't feel very welcome attending AI conferences, and many reported experiencing mental health issues at conferences. They also felt a severe lack of role models and community. Therefore, recognizing this need, recognizing this need, we have facilitated over 13 work workshops and 35 socials in different formats over the last five years in academic conferences spanning AI and machine learning aimed at celebrating the work of queer scientists and developing this community. Our workshops are typically organized by community members planning to attend the conference. However, we often go out of our way to, to encourage junior or new community members to organize these. We mentor and support them, even financially if they need to travel to the conference. And typically, these workshop organizers share a call for panels and talks on the community Slack so everyone can propose topics. And this has led to some really diverse and interesting panels in the last few years, spanning how AI in policing discriminates against trans people in India, animal ethics in AI, immigration and queerness, among others. 
And in all cases, we have compensated the speakers or even paid for the travel expenses if needed, regardless of their status or seniority. And this method of organizing has really taken us a long way in terms of outcomes. Our attendees feel more welcome at AI conferences. These events facilitate social interaction and community. But most importantly, they bring a shared sense of solidarity in the community where we learn about each other's experiences, sharing of which has further mobilized our community to action. And a notable case of the same being with the discussing of operational failures of conferences, which made queer people feel unwel uh, unwelcome, led to the creation of an inclusive conference guide. And this living document has been quite impactful, driving data collection practices around gender, pronouns, and legal names across major conferences, including NeurIPS and, and NACL. Another outcome is a work on trans-inclusive publishing. And this is an important issue because academic institutions often scream applicants for tenure track jobs by citation metrics on platforms like Google Scholar, which are often inaccurate for trans researchers who undergo name changes. To tackle this, our members developed a toolkit to check research papers for citations deadnaming trans authors and correct them. And this has now been integrated into the publication system of the Association for Computational Linguistics and is increasingly being adopted. However, despite all our efforts, there are still challenges we encounter every now and then, and I'll try to cover the most pertinent ones. Conferences are mostly organized in Western countries with significantly higher purchasing power and better economies, making them quite unaffordable for other countries. While we often work with conference organizers to facilitate DEI grants, it does not always work. A recent example being of AAAI, one of the most selective AI conferences, where there were no fee waivers for DNI organizers or attendees. And to such conferences, putting such barriers is very contrary to the diversity and inclusion they claim to be doing. Instead of breaking down barriers, they're essentially building new ones. And there are countries where the safety of queer people becomes a concern. And I don't say that the communities in these countries shouldn't have access to these conferences or events. These are very complex issues, but such decisions must be taken after consulting the communities at risk, as opposed to reaching out to them as a measure of damage control. Another barrier is that of geographical uh, processes, especially visa processes, which are not only expensive, but also very time-taking. For example, I, as an Indian, should know two years prior to the, uh, to the conference in the US that I'm submitting to, be sure of my work's acceptance, and also book all my travel and stay-related options. And lastly, academic conferences do not prioritize removing accessibility barriers with their budgets. So while we've tried to tackle some of these issues, uh, we've funded marginalized organizers from various countries to enable them in attending these events. We've hosted social events not affiliated with the conference, but close to the conference venue, so people can attend them. In many cases where conferences refuse to provide support, we fund the arrangement of live captions and do our best to secure equipment based on member needs. So to summarize my talk, uh, we are not perfect. Uh, participation in query and AI requires English proficiency, access to computers and internet, income that allows volunteers to do free labor and so on. While our diversity is still improving, we still lack access to queer networks in the global south, especially those where queerness itself is, is, is criminalized. Our funding in most cases comes from big tech companies that are complicit in oppression. But Diversity, equity, and inclusion will always involve making some very difficult decisions, but how you approach these decisions and trade-offs will largely dictate the nature of your work. So I implore you to reflect on your use of participatory methods. Shifting power is often the first step towards dismantling justice. So, thank you, and I would like to acknowledge the queer in our community for allowing me to serve them over the last year, and friends and mentors who have supported me in my journey, and all the queer people in my life who have given me hope. Thank you. Thank you, Matt, Aswin, for your talk. So now we have around 15 minutes, right, for Q&A? Kind of. Yeah, we have like 15 minutes. OK, so before starting the open Q&A with participants, I have a few questions that also you, we have discussed before. Uh, like some idea that you, you gave in, in your talk, uh, Sarah, is like the technological development is not taking us to a more fair society. 
And I think this is something that uh, many people uh, would agree and most of the sessions in the sitting phase and related conferences <coughs> are, or many talks are covering limitations, risk that exist by the use of, of AI. But I wanted to also move away from a technophobic discourse uh, because this can happen to any kind of uh, other kind of technology like the internet, like the internet. Uh, we can have, a, uh, some people might have like a technophobic approach to it and based it on very good reasons like surveillance capitalism, for instance. Uh, but also we should agree like the internet allowed, allowed us to create like many uh, interesting uh, opportunities that might not existed before and because of these uh, innovation shift, these new opportunities appear. So there are new opportunities that are going to be brought uh, through AI to our society or we expect them to happen. Uh, so <clears throat> most of the discourse at this moment is set up by big tech co uh, corporations and there are even like some frames like AI for good that I totally disagree because they only talk about the good, but the good of who, how is that good going to be achieved? There is not, uh, uh, this is an instrumentalization of AI for doing something that is supposedly is good, but under some frameworks, like I, I totally uh, distrust that good is going to be obtained. So how can we, instead of having only a resistance uh, approach to AI and to protect the digital right that is critical for sure, but also how can we have like a, Reappropriation of AI for the good. Vale, a ver, es la pregunta. Well, this is a hard and a tough question. This is the toughest question, and for sure, amongst our audience, uh, many may have some ideas on how we can deal with it. The idea is that you can share your ideas about the questions that are being raised, uh, so we open the debate, uh, so you can uh, bring, you can share whatever you might uh, consider as interesting. I think everything is to be done. There is uh, so much to do at an individual and collective level. I mean, very few years ago we were away from the line we are here, even at the debate of these uh, things that people share, that people debate on this. Uh, I think that this is essential, this is critical. In the current situation at an individual level, in an isolated way, it is uh, much difficult to own uh, this technology because uh, this technology is uh, far away from us. Uh, it uh, demands many resources, there are many barriers at an individual scale. Everyone can, can do what he or she can, but it is much uh, complicated. It is easier to move uh, towards these uh, horizons uh, through the common organization. There are organizations uh, that are working on this uh, subject and from that on, the answers will be much more simple. Citizenry and civil organizations, the organizations of civil society that are working on this from the university, there are plenty of things to be done. And we could generate, uh, we could put pressure on public powers. So because this is paramount, some things are being done at the Barcelona City Council, they try to do things uh, from the creation of the uh, measure of the government about uh, AI. You are used to things that have been done and with the undone things. I guess the idea of the citizens' agreement beyond the advisory councils is a measure that is uh, yet to come. We have to involve any kind of people on the debate about uh, which uh, systems are implemented in the city. How do we want to be governed? I don't know whether you want to talk uh, more about this. I, I, I think an interesting example that comes to my mind when we talk about pre-appropriating or like reclaiming these AI technologies of is one of like 
machine translation or uh, especially you know uh, integrating languages into digital systems especially those are like very low resource there are groups like masakhane nlp and a lot of them which um, really employ these participatory process really well from the start and then they create these ai systems about their own languages which were you know otherwise being used by companies and you know big big tech going there using their language commodifying it making various use cases that mostly break because they don't have much understanding of the language so i think this example is just really interesting because of people just come together build technologies from the start using participatory design about their own culture and language and then these technologies work much better because these people have a much better understanding of how their language works and uh, yeah so my next question and then we we'll go to open debate it relates to to what you were just commenting and and also Sarah you mentioned like uh, there are more and more initiatives and there are uh, organize efforts in the civil society to promote the participation of citizens in uh, in aspect related to AI and but also like uh, vulnerable uh, minority. I wouldn't say vulnerable because it's putting the focus on the on the person that is suffering. It's like uh, minorities that are being oppressed. They are not vulnerable. They are being oppressed. It's, it's quite different. So uh, we often discuss on how to bring diversity, and when we bring diversity, uh, focus on bringing diversity, we're thinking in, in the area of uh, opening participation, like having more participation of, and having more diverse participation, but how we can, what are the challenges or, that we should address to convert that participation to transformation? So it's not only more people and more diverse people participating in those debates around AI, but also those people and those more diverse pool of people Transformate, uh, doing transformative actions into the paradigm of AI. And you, you can build from your experience, like, uh, for instance, analyzing uh, this, uh, these focus groups with other people and how they were being uh, perceived their interactions uh, with AI technologies, or also with example of how to open the scientific community for, for uh, queer representation. How to, how to transform participation into transformation? Like what are the main challenges the, and the, ex, the steps that need to be taken, not only okay. to participate, but also to transform? Yeah, I think with, with respect to participation, the main challenge that I see, even while you know, working with queer and AI, it's, it's very difficult to uh, run an organization without you know, uh, like paying all the volunteers, because it's very unsustainable work for all of us, because even Currently, it's entirely volunteer run, and these are people who are already suffering a lot of consequences because of not just AI systems, but also the social political systems in their countries. You know, there are like unsafe uh, clim social and legal climates across many countries around the world. So it's already very hard for these people to volunteer and build these communities. And when there is participation, we have to, f I think, first acknowledge that participation is work because uh, other because otherwise it's it's very hard to like you know devote so much of your time to it and like not get a return out of it that that's very hard for any individual to like go through it so i think the first step to doing participation ethically is doing it long term and not uh, acknowledging it as work compensating people who actually participate and doing it by doing it long term i mean is you don't just reach out to people when there are harms right like uh, you know you've done something bad the media has covered it now you have to like cover your tracks but that's not how it should be done it should be, you should have like a long term conversations, the people you have. And you know, the main uh, challenge of employing participatory design in corporations is first, there's a lack of trust because the same AI systems have been harming these people. The next is participatory methods involve co design. And in co design, the power distance should be minimal. And when you have a white person going to, you know, all these like, African countries and you know building these technologies for them the power distance is just so much and they don't do it like anthropologists who go into the field and you know they're spending a year just building rapo and so that the communities trust them there's no there's lack of trust there's power distance and all of these barriers need to be dismantled but the the the, uh, the reason they do participatory methods in such a rush way is also because of uh, you know they're driven by profits they have to like meet their deadlines and like move fast but the system like really fails participation. Yeah. To answer as quick as possible. We do have still t some time. All right. I think that to participate uh, 
it is something that will allow us to transform things. I don't know if I'm making myself com understand. I don't know if you are getting the point, but if there is a real opportunity to participate, on the one hand, it's very, very important to stop with the power concentration only in the hands of the private sector, you know, because it uh, doesn't allow almost anything to be possible with uh, everything in the hands of the private sector. When we participate in the implementation of these kind of systems, I'm talking only about systems created by people for people to take advantage of the potential of these technologies at the, their favor, which is another way to be proactive. Uh, so how to reappropriate in a very solid manner the technology and to develop it in an open manner. But those systems that were implemented, let's say, in a public institutions, uh, they should be able to share the information, uh, feasible and information, what kind of systems they are using, and to get involved in the decision-taking processes. So we want these systems to get implemented and to be used for this purpose or not. Do we have to change this or that? Because, you know, in reality, things are not working very well, and this has an impact on vulnerable people, and they are suffering a lot, you know. So making things possible and to participate for improving the system's governance, to participate and to say, hey, let's stop using this because we want to create something else. That's a very strong transformative participation as well, right? Yeah, that's my opinion. Yes, you know, in reality, I really like to s put an end to this uh, power concentration only in the hands of a pa private sector. This is the idea of asymptotic Marxism. Any conversation uh, related with AI and bias uh, talks about capitalism. I don't know, mar asymptotic Marxism, that's the concept. Well, participating can be very transformative. Participation can transform many, many things. I think that now it's uh, audience participation time. Any questions to Sarah? No? Pues los hemos dejado. Cao. Maybe you are knocked out. Okay. I will do uh, the la, la última pregunta. So <laughs> ask you the last question. There has been like more awareness of the time of uh, the, the effects that can happen because of uh, algorithmic discrimination and there has been a lot of focus on aspects like gender, uh, racial origin that has been uh, these were already problems that uh, there were uh, concerns around it before AI, but now with AI, this uh, has been intensified. And uh, like in your talk, you address groups that might have received le less attention, like older people, uh, also queer groups. Uh, but I, I also like that with an intersectional uh, perspective. So with other groups, uh, you can say that might be at risk, might be groups oppressed, that should be at under higher risk uh, in this new era of AI and how these underrepresented groups uh, can be better represented in conversation and how we as citizens, researchers, or any other kind of stakeholder can facilitate their participation and empowerment. Okay, I can go first. Uh, I think the first group that comes to mind is even a part of my own identity because I belong to a lower caste group in India and uh, in India there's something that's a caste system. Uh, a lot of people draw a lot of parallels to racism but it's a little different because it's graded. Like there's a lot of castes, there's upper castes and lower castes and lower castes are almost uh, always discriminated against. Uh, there have been efforts by a lot of uh, groups like Equality Labs in the US to outlaw uh, caste discrimination in a lot of uh, universities in the US. However, uh, legally there hasn't been uh, a lot of you know, luck with that outside of India uh, in, uh, in terms of outlawing caste discrimination. And I think the, uh, the first step is I think even organizations do not really uh, acknowledge caste discrimination in their, let's say, code of conduct. And this is something that uh, the lower caste diaspora from India all around the world r really faces repercussions from. And it is... Uh, not as visible, but still a very visible market of identity because uh, you can almost always know a person's caste by their surname. 
So even if you know you don't uh, put it out there, people know. And a lot of people try to not use their surnames, but a lot of the de design of you know like not just technologies, but also stuff like forms, legal work, or uh, you have your surname out there. So people really know what identity you belong to, and then they discriminate against you. And to provide some examples of uh, how AI discriminates against lower caste people in India. Uh, a lot of cities in India, uh, a, a, a lot of cities in India have a, have surveillance. Uh, I can give example of one uh, state, Madhya Pradesh, where uh, in certain urban areas, the police is coordinating with the upper caste uh, neighborhoods to install CCTV cameras there, and so the uh, up, the upper caste citizens actually have a stake in policing, and the people who are being uh, policed are mostly lower caste groups, and there's a lot of predictive policing. To the extent where you know, whenever these people, as soon as they're born, uh, they're labeled as criminals because of these systems, uh, and ev even how the data is collected by the Indian police system, it doesn't uh, really distinguish between like uh, caste, and there's also uh, no good categories for transgender people. So, even the collection of data for trans people who are incarcerated becomes very difficult because the forms themselves don't collect that data. So. And if you don't have data reform, again, as a consequence, becomes very hard. So there are a lot of issues at the intersection of caste and queerness uh, that I can go on and on about. But I definitely think uh, uh, people who uh, are minoritized on the basis of caste, this is really an issue that most organizations need to start addressing. Uh, yeah. uh, I don't want to be very simplistic or to reduce something to just a, an idea. But once we deal with the categories that will suffer more impacts or the most negative impacts, um, let me think about it. You know, categories that set this uh, digital gap or that produces this digital gap or the categories of society or that will be more impacted by the digital technology development in general terms are people that they will suffer in the regular world. So the digital gap is another added gap, another economic gap. So any kind of people category or social class that will be impacted by many other things will be also impacted by digital gap. What can we do from the academia world? We must be aware about it. I don't know. We must uh, be aware of these difficulties, yes. We must be aware about the lack of participation of specific communities, how to involve these communities, but also from your side, you must make an effort to research and to gather and to contemplate everything that is needed to crystal clear say what are the needs of these uh, uh, non prestige communities. Okay, thank you very much for your uh, contribution and for your conversation. And now let's carry on with the next session. We talk about different experiences, and the next one is talk about the future and the feminist practices to fight for human rights. Thank you again for your participation. Thank you very much.